All right, if everybody could come on in and um, find a seat, that would be wonderful. Good morning. Good morning to everyone. Wonderful to see everybody. Uh, wonderful to be here uh, preparing our hearts to worship, um, to receive from the Lord all that he would have for us. And uh, as, we, as we do worship this morning, certainly worship is more than just the actual playing of music and singing of songs. Uh, this whole morning is an act of worship. Uh, where we bow our hearts, we lift our hands in songs, we bow our hearts as we hear God's word, uh, we yield up our possessions in giving, uh, and uh, this morning we're also going to, as a body, uh, we're going to read God's word over one another. So after our second song, uh, Hang will lead us in a time of, um, we'd ask that you would would uh, think of or find a, a scripture that's really impactful for you, maybe one that you've been chewing on lately, one that's been encouraging you, challenging you. Uh, and if you would just find that in your Bibles, and after our second song, we're just going to ask uh, folks, whoever the Lord would lead and whoever would want to come up here, and there'll be a couple mics uh, for, for us to read God's word over one another. A verse or two or three, uh, whatever the Lord leads you in, I guess anything short of a chapter or book. Um, but hey, if that's where the Lord leads, were we to say no. Uh, so uh, please just think of that what that scripture is. And even if you don't have it memorized, no worries. Open your Bibles and after the second song, please come up. But we will start with, uh, with lifting our voices uh, and praising God in worship. And as I thought of that, actually as a couple of us were praying this morning, um, uh, Daniel's, uh, uh, Daniel's uh, recording of Nebuchadnezzar's confession came to our minds as we thought about worship. Nebuchadnezzar a few times in his life, if you guys don't know the story, Nebuchadnezzar is uh, uh, the king of Babylon uh, back in the 600 BC-ish time frame and led the destruction of Jerusalem. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a king, the scripture says of Nebuchadnezzar, whom he would he slew and whom he would he kept alive. That's the power and authority that Nebuchadnezzar had over the known world at that time. And, uh, and a few times in his life, God showed him some really amazing stuff. And uh, both of those times when Daniel interpreted his dream and when, uh, when God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire, God showed him some pretty amazing stuff with his eyes. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar made some declarations about God. But it wasn't until after Nebuchadnezzar was broken in his own spirit by God and humbled for seven years, broken in mind and spirit, that he made this declaration uh, over God. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Let's pray before we worship. Heavenly Father, that is the God that we are coming together this morning to worship and to praise, to speak to and to hear from, to receive from and to give to, Father. And I pray that you would fill everyone here by your Holy Spirit to worship you as only you are worthy. You are worthy of all honor, all praise, all might, all glory are yours, Father. And we agree with one another in that as we worship you this morning. Receive that from us, Father, and with pure hearts and minds in Jesus' name. Thanks so much, Ray. Why don't we stand together, church? I want to say God is great. You say it all the time. All right, let's try that. God is great. Okay, that's like a little bit sleepy, you know. That's all right. Let's try it one more time, okay? God is great. And all the time. One more time. God is great. And all the time. Let's clap those hands, church. You know this hand.
Lord, you are great. Amen, amen. And as Rick said, I want to sing one more song. And after this song, we're going to have a time of open my scripture reading for those who came in late. And just pick a verse or three and just come up and share after this next song. Amen. As we continue to worship, why don't you turn around, greet somebody, especially those who didn't come to church with you. Give them a well, warm welcome. Just signal me if you guys are sitting like on the end of the row. Could you guys please move toward the middle, toward the center, so that those who come late could find chair? So move toward the middle, guys. Don't be afraid. We're one family. <laughs> Amen. Let's worship Him, church. Sing it out. The sun sets free, who oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me, His grace runs. Why was the same to see Jesus now? Yes, he died for me, who oh, the sun sets free, oh, it's free.
out against me I am who you say I am I am chosen, not forsaken I am who you say I am You are for me, not against me Nehemiah 8.10 Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared for this day, to holy, is holy to the Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Come on, church, don't be shy now. We're worshiping the Lord this morning, amen? These are his words.
Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Proverbs 3, 1 through 4. Uh, Do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands on your heart. Well, they will prolong your life many years in peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck and write them on your heart so that you might find favor with God and amongst men. our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. That's Psalm 46, 1 to 3. 2 Corinthians, when, when we stand together, church, chapter 2, verse 4, chapter 4, verse seven but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us we are hard pressed on every side but not crushed perplexed but not despair persecuted but not abandoned struck down but not destroyed always carrying around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body verse 18 Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting the way, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweigh them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporal, but what is unseen is eternal. When I heard this next hymn that we're about to sing, Grace Thy Faithfulness, on the Gospel Coalition, and Pastor John Piper wrote these two verses, and I just melt, I just worship the Lord, and I want to introduce this to you. It's a hymn, Grace Thy Faithfulness, verse 1 and 4, but verse 2 and 3 is penned by Pastor John Piper. Sing in our church. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with Thee. Thou changes not Thy compassion, they fail not. As Thou hast been, Thou forever. sing.
Please be seated, church. Welcome to Vertical Life Church. We're glad you're here. My name is Ray Facino. I'm sorry, it's Rick Whaley. And uh, no, it's you guys trying to figure out names while I'm gone. My name is John Kinningham. And we're glad that you're here with us. If you would pull out this card that you were given and just rip off the bottom, we'd love to know that you're here just to send you a thank you letter, thanking you for coming and worshiping with us. We appreciate it. And uh, also just to provide you with any additional information that you might have questions about the church. Also, if you have a prayer request, we would love to have you write that on the back. We pray for that. If you want it for leadership only, just color in the dot at the bottom and that will simply go to the leadership of the church for us to pray for you. It's a journey, a pilgrimage we're all on with many trials and tribulations, yet God is so faithful as we just sang. And as we pray for one another, we know that God by his spirit moves in just a mighty powerful way. So thank you for filling that out and you can just drop that in when it comes by. Also, if any of you have changed your email, phone number, address, whatever, uh, just put that on there and that way we can make the correction uh, in our system. We have the opportunity to work for Christ. We're about the three W's, worship, walk, and work. That's the kind of disciple that we believe Jesus wants us to make, and we all want to make disciples and be a disciple. Well, one way to work for Christ is serving in the children's ministry. And as we're getting ready to launch the fall, really, season of ministry, we need, we always need more uh, workers in the children as the children keep coming into the church, and we know how that happens ultimately. Uh, but So, gentlemen, I would challenge you. I don't know why the children are always greeted with a whole bunch of women the whole time. Thank God for the women. But men, we can step up as well. We're part of the problem that brought the children into the church. So, we can go and help serve. And quite honestly, if you can't share the gospel, share the love of Jesus with a child, I don't know how you're going to expect to do it with a coworker or something. Because to get it at that level is ultimately uh, what we need to do. So there's many opportunities there. Uh, two weeks from yesterday, there's a meeting, and we'd love for you to come October 18th, 9 a.m., right here. Even if you just have questions about it, come to that meeting. Uh, but let us know, and we will get you in touch with Terry Molina. Uh, but we just need people to step up constantly. It's a way to love one another. A week from yesterday is... Biblical Soul Care Saturday. It's on the card here. It has the information. And Lee Lewis will be with us again from 9 to 1. And we'd love for you to come. It's a great opportunity to hear Lee teach and talk about biblical soul care. And it will encourage you, challenge you. It'll be a blessing to you, I promise. We don't do a lot of Saturday events here. So when we do put them on, it's because we think this is important. And we'd love for you to be here for that. Again, all the information is there. If you need child care, just shoot an email. Let us know so we can plan appropriately for the numbers. And coming up the day uh, after that children's meeting, on the 19th, is a baptism. If you have not been baptized since coming to faith in the Lord Jesus, we're going to do that right in here, our first ever baptism. You see the big water tank out back? Well, you're going to climb up the ladder, and then we're going to put you in that 39,000 gallon tank, and uh, we'll just make sure you're immersed really good. Uh, but there's a ladder coming out. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to set something up right over here, and we'll do it in here uh, on the 19th. If you go to the website, there is a form that's a baptism form that if you could fill that out, it'll email us and let us know, and then we'll talk uh, once we get that. So go to the website. You'll find it says next steps. It says baptism form, and there it is. Just fill that out. Or, or talk to me or send me an email or, or however you want to communicate, let us know. We would love to, to do that. such an important thing. Uh, additionally, this morning as we go to our time of giving, we've started a new format of giving. It's texting. And we've moved beyond gold bullion to paper currency. It's just the progression of life, people. Uh, so whether you want to give online, text to give, the number is there. The first time you do it, it takes you to a URL on your phone. And uh, you have to put in your information, but after that point, you can just text to give if that's how you like to do it, or you can always use the offering bag going by. However you do it, we just want to uh, let you know about that opportunity. And finally, a friend of mine, Adrian Martinez, who I knew in seminary uh, back in 2002, launched today. Is it yesterday in Australia now? Anyway, uh, in Melbourne, Australia, they launched Vertical Church uh, in Melbourne, Australia. 
So if you have any good friends at Melbourne, Australia, uh, tell them about Vertical Church. But as I pray for not only our offering, I want to pray for Vertical Church in Melbourne, Australia, and, uh, and Adrian Martinez as they launch today, which is really yesterday now. But anyway, pray for them and that that ministry be so fruitful in such a, a hardened land of Australia for the gospel. So let's pray together as the ushers come. Our Father, we bow before you in humility, knowing, Lord, that you want your gospel to go throughout all the earth. That in the 1040 window, in the countries that are hard to reach, there you still have your elect ones that you're calling out of the darkness into your marvelous light. That there's a place even in the countries that are the most difficult that we could go and find lovers of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray for Adrian and for his wife and for their, I think, six kids. We pray for them as they are in Australia ministering there. We pray that Vertical Church would grow, that many would be impacted, even as they're right next to a university. Lord, may the gospel go forth in that university town. And may you draw many to yourself through the discipleship and the preaching ministry of Adrian and the leadership team there. In, in Melbourne. Lord, do a great work there. Thank you for like-minded churches, not only there, but around the world that we are a part of in the Great Commission Collective. Continue to expand the gospel and expand and build your church, your kingdom here, Lord, in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity for us to be here. That 10 years ago, Lord, this church launched and here we are today. Thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thankful, thank you, Lord, for the faithful giving of your people. And Lord, even now as we give to you through whatever means we give, we pray it would always be because our heart loves you and we're full of joy to build your kingdom. Lord, glorify yourself by building your church, the church which we love, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. worship we're going to do one more song god you are my god by the vertical life church i mean vertical worship band familiar song and uh actually i didn't plan to say this but i've been sleeping six hours at night and it's not like you know six hours consecutively but every two hours wake up burp two hours burp you know and it's been crazy and then uh, certainly you know my wife is going through that as well sleeplessness and one thing that i really appreciate um one thing I learned, I guess, I want to share with you is that a lot of time when I read the Bible or listen to devotional or listen to the Bible app, you know, how many of you listen to the Bible app as you're driving, like three of you, great. And then it's great, you know, like God's word, I need God's word, but nothing is sinking into my heart. All I, think, all I can think of is when is the next nap? You know, when, when, where, where, where am I? What day is today, you know? And, uh, but one thing that really really encouraging is that the bible verses that i recite and memorize two years ago or when i was a child came back to me you know like i'm reading nothing is you know coming in but the things that the god promises and god's word that i recite four years ago 20 years ago was flooding back into my heart and i was like wow the power of scripture memorization right and so, yeah, I just want to share that. I said, Lord, thank you so much for giving us memorization. And uh, it is hard to recite God's word. But I encourage you to continue to, to labor and to just high treasure his word in your heart. So that when you have those sleepless nights, it will come back to you. And the Holy Spirit can encourage you. Amen. Why don't we stand together, church? We're going to sing one more song. Let's focus our hearts, our eyes on him as we turn to his word. Let's sing this as a prayer. Let's look to the cross.
thankful for Ray and Rick very ably coming up and proclaiming God's word. Again, our presupposition is not the man, it's the message, it's the book that men and women come and go, but the word of the Lord abides forever. Amen? So I had the opportunity to preach out at a camp in Colorado we go to. It's a family camp, and I always snicker at myself when they say, we want your message to be 20, 25 minutes. I'm like, that's an introduction. But, uh, but it was fun, except it was much more high church people than you all. Because I would try to get them, hey, let's respond. And it was just, and the, it says what in the text? There was not going to be a peep that came out of anybody. So it's just such a difference. So thank you for being a bit more interactive than, uh, than some of those. Uh, they didn't stone me, but, but uh, it, it worked out okay. No, it was a great group. Really enjoyed it. You know, there was a person or persons in your life 
that you try to please, whether that be a boss, whether that be a friend, a colleague, co-worker, children, parents, grandparents, you want to please them. I remember a supervisor I worked for at my first field office for the government. His name was Tony Zotto. Not a tall man, but he was like a fire hydrant. And Tony was the one who started on the presidential detail, the counter assault team. Tony was an Italian from New York City. And Tony was not one to be messed with. Very kind. But I always thought if I didn't please him, there might be a mafia hit out on me from Tony. So one time on a protective visit, I was the lead advance. And I did something I should not have done. And I knew it after it had happened. And I looked down the hallway, and here comes Tony walking towards me. Here comes the fire hydrant. Oh, no. So the lump grows in my throat. And here's how the conversation went as Tony arrived to where I was standing. Do you know what just happened there? Oh, yes, sir, I do. Let's not let that happen again. Oh, no, sir, I will not. That will never happen again. And if you want to find out what that was, you owe me a Diet Coke and we'll go, I'll tell you the story. But that's not germane to the point. Tony did not have to get all over me because he knew I wanted to be a good agent. He knew I wanted to, he knew I wanted to please him as my supervisor, that I wanted to do what he wanted me to do. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. If you're not there, I'll give you a moment. Da, 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 da. Go to Hebrews 11, verse 6. Because this is what is so key and what the writer has been trying to tell his readers in Hebrews and explaining to them that Hebrews eleven six 6, and without faith, it is impossible to what? To please God. It is impossible to please God without what? Faith. You have to have faith in order to please God. God, you can think through whatever people in your life you're trying to please, and there's different categories, and what are they like? Well, here is God's category. Without faith, it is impossible for you to please me. You cannot please me apart from me. You cannot ever, 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 ever please him. No matter how many good works you do, no matter how many times you read the Bible, listen to the Bible, study the Bible, memorize the Bible in Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, it doesn't matter. Without faith, it is impossible to please him, regardless of the amount of scholarship you have, degrees you have, average name, how many years you go to seminary, it doesn't matter. Without faith, it is what? Impossible to please him. And so this morning, what we're going to look at is what does faith that is pleasing to God look like? If your goal, and it hopefully is this morning, I'm presuming this on all of you, you want to have a faith that pleases God, right? Just like I want to please Tony, I want, we want to have a faith that pleases God. And this is exactly what Hebrews chapter 11 is all about. He wants to say, let's put up portraits in my mind, this is how I view it, as I said two weeks ago, the portraits of the halls of faith as we walk through and consider what did they do, how did they live that was pleasing to the Almighty? That God said, I want to take this person out of obscurity as they were living in Babylonia or wherever they were living. I want to take them out of obscurity and I want to enshrine them into the hall of faith of Hebrews 11 for all subsequent Christian generations to look at and for them to say, I was pleased with them because they had faith. Well, how was their faith known? It was very tangible. Again, it's not in what they said, it's how they lived how they responded to God in their certain circumstances. And I would guarantee if you studied this chapter enough, your circumstances are in Hebrews 11. They're here. They're here for us to consider and to contemplate and to put our life up against the lives of these people. And remember, these were ordinary people. They put on their sandals one foot at a time as you do, or not in some cases. They put on their robes one arm at a time or shirt or whatever they wore back then. There were normal people living life in a hard world. And the Holy Spirit wants us to consider each one and then emulate what is our faith, where is our faith that is pleasing to God compared to those who are listed here. Let me read this section we're going to consider. 
And I might as well begin in verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. Forever who would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be their God, be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city." Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the, pro the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of, his, of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. As you read through this chapter, it is clear that these individuals had faith, but it wasn't faith in word only. Too often today we live in a world that is, I believe, but you would really fain to find where the evidence of their faith impacts with how they live their daily life. You see the faith in this chapter affected not only internally, but externally, and therefore it's truly life transforming. You see, each action you take reflects what you believe. Who you are in your mind is the true you. Who you are when no one is looking is the true you. You see, true, genuine, God-honoring faith is faith that produces obedience because the faith is based upon the promises of God in the pages of Scripture. So the promises of God that a person believes, that then drives their obedience to God because they've embraced the promises. If I said a year from now, I'm going to give you $100 million, and you could substantiate, I actually had that kind of money, you wouldn't do it because you know I don't, but if I did have that amount, and you could verify what it was, you would live in light of a year from now. You would live in light of that coming inheritance that I was going to give to you. You would live with that mindset. That's the same way that has happened with these individuals that are in the pages of Hebrews 11. They were living in light of what is coming to them based upon uh, the promises of God. Now, what's amazing here, this is a very long section that I read all about Abraham and a few close descendants. Essentially, we were in the books of Genesis. But in the portrait gallery of faith, we've really walked into a room that set off. We've seen the portraits of Noah and, and the others, and Abel that were mentioned there. But now there's a room in the gallery that's really devoted to the man Abraham, as he is the, really the father of the faithful. He's the father of the faithful. And what we're going to see is what does pleasing faith look like? So number one, pleasing faith is an obedient faith. Pleasing faith is an obedient faith. So Abraham becomes very prominent here and is held up to be a friend of God. 
His faith has been praised and lifted in his example, not only in Hebrews, but the apostle Paul lifts up Abraham. And James lifts up Abraham as well. He was called of God, and according to Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and verse 2, it says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. The God of glory appeared to Abraham. Now, we don't have time to turn this to your homework. Genesis chapter 12 and following is where it describes the account of God appearing to Abraham, calling Abraham. But in these few verses, right here in 11.8, we really have Cliff's notes. How many of you use those in college? Don't confess that. But we have the Cliff's note version of Genesis. But of course, the writer's presuming they totally remember studying and being impacted by Genesis and Abraham. Because by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He was called to go. So initially, the promise to Abraham, this is the call. There were two promises. One is the promise of an inheritance. The other is the promise of offspring. Land, blessing, and a seed, offspring. And this is what verse 8 is beginning with. It's talking about the land, the blessing God wanted to give to him. But he was called to go. He was called to go. If you would come over to my house and you happen to catch me walking out, and I was walking out this and go into my pickup truck, assuming I didn't pick it up that lightly, if I was walking out, what would be the question you would ask me? Nick, you're an intelligent man. What would you ask me as I'm walking out? What? Fine question. Where are you going, right? All nod north, south. Yeah, where are you going? I don't know. I'm just, I, I don't know. Well, Nick would then say, are you packed? Or are you just selling? No, it's packed. We're leaving. But what? I, I don't know where we're going. What would you do then? John, you're local in La Mesa. What, what, what are you thinking? That's what Abraham did. He went into his wife and he said, Sarah, uh, we need to talk about something. Can you, um, can you give me a moment? Abram, Abram why, why do you have a suitcase? Oh, let's not talk about suitcase right now. <laughs> um, God's told me we need to go. But where in Ur are the Chaldeans? This is a great city. I mean, this is in the Fertile Crescent. I, I mean, this is a great place. Where are we going to go? Uh, I don't know. What do you, you don't know. We're just going to, like, start walking? Yep. Let's load up everything, grab our suitcases. Honey, we're leaving. Why are we leaving? Because God's made a promise that he will guide us on the way. Well, can you at least pull it up on Google Maps? I mean, can we put it in destination, show some pictures? Think about it. They had no idea where they were going. They had not seen the place. It's not like they can go and, and read you know, TripAdvisor and get reviews of the place. But I, think, I mean, think about this. These are real people living in a real time that God appeared and God called him to go to a place to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, you see the phrase in verse 8, not knowing. Not knowing. Faith drives obedience when you aren't sure of the outcome that you don't know. We don't like not knowing, right? We do all we can to not, they say a, a good attorney, you never put a witness on the stand, you don't know exactly what they're going to say, right? You have to know. But that's not what faith is. Faith is the reality that you trust God and you obey him even though you do not know the outcome. You don't know the outcome when Abraham was taking off. I don't know the land. I don't know what it's going to look like. But God has made a promise, and I believe the promise, Sarah, we need to go. We need to be faithful to this God. And Sarah ultimately said, let's go. And so it wasn't loading up a suitcase. It was loading up all the servants. It was loading up everything Abram, Abraham left. And then Lot saying, hey, I want to go. Sounds like a party. And then Lot joining in the whole crew. And they, they all take off for this journey. So he's held up, verse 9. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. His faith made him a pilgrim and a worshiper. He was on a pilgrimage. 
Even though he was in the land of promise, see how he thought of himself. He was in a foreign land, amongst the people in the land. But yet he remained a sojourner, a pilgrim by faith. They were nomadic. They had no permanent home. In fact, none of the three men who are mentioned here lived to see the actual fulfillment of the promise. Abraham did not see the fulfillment of the promise. Isaac did not see the fulfillment of the promise. Jacob did not see the fulfillment of the promise. None of them did. They kept looking forward, which is the idea of a promise, right? It's forward-looking. By definition, a promise is forward-looking. I love verse 10. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. You see, once God made the promise to Abraham, you know what happened to Abraham? It didn't matter that he was living in a tent. It didn't matter he was a stranger in a strange land. He knew one day that land would be his because he trusted the promise of God. And he became discontent in the world in which he lived, focusing instead on the promise that God had made and looking forward to that time And that compelled his heart such that his actions of obedience followed his heart, which was following a promise. One writer says that faith brings the future into the present and brings the invisible into view. That's really good. I'll say it again because I know you want to hear it again. Faith brings the future into the present and brings the invisible into view. In faith, Abraham sojourned in a foreign country But the whole time, he was looking forward to a city, to a city. He was obviously an urban city boy out in the midst of the country. But the word for looking means that he was not only looking, but awaiting with eager expectation. Oh, wouldn't that be great to be said of each of us as we're breathing our last? That we could stand here at your memorial service And we say, you know what? They always live life looking forward to the future. And now their future is reality. It is reality. But it wasn't just a city that God promised. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself received the power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead were born descendants, as many as the stars of heaven, as many as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So they go from nothing, no land, no inheritance, to that. And now the writer says, but let's look at the descendants, because he and Sarah had no children. Now, I really struggle with how the ESV is translated verse 11, because I don't think it's right at all. And it's not because I'm some great biblical scholar up here, you all know that, contrary But I don't think, think about this with me. I don't think he changes subjects here to Sarah. He doesn't switch the subject because right after verse 11 is verse 12. Who's the subject in verse 12? Uh, This wasn't meant to be hard, by the way. Who's the subject in verse 12? Abraham. Abraham's the subject of this whole thing. So why would all of a sudden we jump to Sarah? I think the NIV, 1984, and it's not often that I say this, has it right. Jonathan, oh. We'll talk later about other passages. But Jonathan, would you throw up, please? And not throw up, but put, there you go. By faith, this is the NIV 1984. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren. So Sarah's in the verse, but it's talking about the faith of Abraham, not of Sarah. Was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful. It was the faith of Abraham that is the subject here, not Sarah's faith. He considered him faithful who had made the promise. That, to me, matches the subject and coincides perfectly with the way the Greek is as well. It can be translated the way it is in verse 11, but I think it misses the point of what the author's trying to say. He's speaking of Abraham and the fact that Abraham, and the word, if you want to get tech, uh, uh, is spermatos, spermatos in Greek, the seed, the seed of the man was the issue in their infertility. And therefore, he's saying here, it's not that, yes, she was barren, 
but there was an issue with the spermatos as well, the seed. And so God, in his kindness and faithful to his promise, was able to give them children, even though Abraham is 100 years old. 100. Sarah's 90. Imagine going to that hospital visitation. <laughs> Abraham, oh, my brother, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> Uh, here's a rattle for your little one. Here's, you know, he's 100 years old, and yet God is faithful. He's speaking about Abraham and how faithful he was, and yet God, Abraham believed at 100 he could have a child. Not, not from a servant, but one of his own, and he trusted God in this. In fact, I want you to hang a left here and go over to Romans because Paul picks up on the same idea. In Romans chapter 4, beginning in verse 18, because what is so important to see is not if you're sitting here with infertility issues to have the faith of Abraham. That's not what he's talking about at all. God did not make a promise to any of us, the promise he made to Abraham in Genesis 12 and in Genesis 15 and in Genesis 17. We're different than that. But Paul correlates well the faith of Abraham, what we should believe, Romans 4.18. In hope, he believed against hope. Who are we talking about here? Abraham. That he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told. So shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith. He did not weaken in faith. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also, that we also should have many children at the age of 100. No, that's not what he says. That's not, that's not the corollary here. But for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in what? In him who raised from the dead, Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So the faith that is transferred is not the... the, the a corollary to Abraham's faith in children, but faith trusting the promise to God that he raised Abraham. He might as well raised him from the dead because he was essentially dead, but that we believe he raised the Lord Jesus from the dead and trust the promises of God in the resurrection. That in light of that, we lay hold of that promise and our obedience is birth because we believe the promise of God in Christ, that if anyone believes in his name, they shall be saved. If anyone places their faith and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was dead and buried and <laughs> resurrected, that if we place our faith there, God has made a promise. Do you believe the promise that you shall be saved? That's the promise God has made. And in light of that promise, we then live in obedience to the Word of God as He called us. In what areas as Christians are we failing to obey God? Is our faith living and, and is it active? Is it producing obedience in our hearts to this God because of the promise He has made? Secondly, pleasing faith is a sojourning faith. Pleasing faith is a sojourning faith. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. Hello. Greeted them from afar. I love that phrase. I just, hey, hello. He greeted the promises from afar, not, not even thinking that the promises would ever get there in their lifetime. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. What a great tribute this is to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. They did not receive the promises in this life. No one could have penned a book back then, your best life now. Because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have said, now? No. The promises are yet to come. We're looking forward to those one day. You think my tent 
is the greatest thing now or to get a new Coleman tent? That's not what they were looking forward to. It, it wasn't being satisfied here in this world. They just said, we're on a pilgrimage. We're strangers. We're exiles on this earth. We're seeking a, a city, a, a place to come that isn't even here. We're seeking a homeland in verse 14. Now, look in verse 15. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, or the Chaldeans, what could they have done? Gone back. Hey, let's pack the bags. This is a bit difficult over here. Then have quite the modern amenities, Wi-Fi things we like. They have that nerve, Chaldeans. Let's just travel back. In fact, one writer says, from the call of Abraham to the death of Jacob was a space of 200 years. How many? 200. Abraham died at 175. So 200 years. During this period, they might have easily returned to the land of Chaldeans. The distance was not an obstacle. But they gave clear evidence that they were not disposed to return. Abraham takes an oath of his servant that he will not endeavor to induce Isaac to return to that land. They were indeed seeking a country, but it was a better one, a heavenly one. They looked for true happiness in a future state. That is the reality of faith. You look for true happiness in a future state. A state where this, this body of death is finally ready to die. Hate to tell you this, all of you are dieting like crazy and exercising like crazy for some, uh, you're still going to die, okay? And you shouldn't say, really? Really? I just got a new book on a new diet that's really going to be bad years from now. It won't. But that shouldn't cause your heart to be fearful. You should look forward to when you're finally going to breathe your last because you're a sojourner here. Amen? This is not your home. It wasn't their home. Faith says this isn't. We're a stranger and an exile here on this earth. Our hope and joy and our life are squarely placed on the things that are to come, on the promises God has made. And it brings God's pleasure, brings him pleasure when his children acknowledge that they are sojourners, that our prayer requests aren't always, Lord, give me a bigger this and a better that and more of this and more of that and, nah, 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 and I have a whole list of stuff that I want my whole, I remember when I was a kid and I got the brand new Sears catalog for Christmas in 19, whatever. Uh, I remember looking through those eyes, man, I want this and circling, I want this. Oh, look at that cool NFL jacket. Oh, I want that. Nah, 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 nah. For many of us, that's our prayer list. God, thanks for the catalog of everything we see in the world. Let me give you my list of what I want. And he says, what about me? Do you want me? Or do you really just want this world? Because if you have the love of the world, what is not in you? The love of the Father is not in you. We've got to look at them and say, even though we live in a great technological time, this world is still fading and will pass away. This world is going away, which is why the gospel is making inroads in third world countries like never before. When you're living in a hut, go to Haiti sometime. Hurricane comes in, it takes them like two days to rebuild their hut. They're right back up and running with life. Here, where we're devastated for years. Which life is, would you really rather have almost? People that flooded during Harvey. I think some of them might say, we might take the hut. <laughs> when that just is so hard to deal with all the implications of these things but we must keep in mind that a genuine faith is a sojourning faith this world is not our home this isn't it god would just say man could you imagine if you could have a five second glimpse of heaven just place you on a mountaintop in heaven and just let you look around for five seconds you would be like whoa Whoa, I can't wait to get there. It would so blow you away, but it can't even be described. They tried to in Revelation, but it's just so far beyond our comprehension. You're a soldier. That's a faith that pleases God, that we all acknowledge we're sojourners. Third, pleasing faith is an offering faith. Pleasing faith is an offering faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. 
And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was even able to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. It is important to remember that God does not tempt man, but he does test and try the faith of his believing people with the purpose of proving the quality and the caliber of their faith. So he's not, he's not tempting, but he does test. And there's a huge important distinction. In fact, he's going to get into that in Hebrews chapter 12. But for Abraham, the greatest trial of his faith came on the day that God asked for Isaac. He finally gets the son of promise. And in Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2, it says, After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I, which is just an expression, Lord, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, Abraham had more than one son, but Isaac was what? The son of promise. He was the son of promise. And he believed that God would fulfill his promise of everything through the means of Isaac. And God was now putting that faith to test, to say, I want you to go and I want you to sacrifice your son. Now, you've got to remember, this was not uncommon in their day. There were religious belief systems back during this time that did offer children, especially in fire, that you would go offer your child in a child's sacrifice to please the gods. But for God to ask Abraham to do so made no earthly sense. None. Zero. Isaac was the promise. How can I go offer him as a sacrifice and kill him? And yet, God, you fulfill your promise. There was no human way speaking to reconcile the two situations, to reconcile the promise and the fulfillment of the promise and the commandment that God had just given him. They were unreconcilable. But yet Abraham knew what he had to do, that God had given Isaac to him. And what was God saying? I want Isaac back. And for Abraham to say, then he's yours. And for him to walk. I look forward to getting to heaven and having a conversation with Abraham. What were you thinking as you were walking? Well, you know what he was And the resolve of his mind and heart was obedience to God, though the outcome of it did not make sense. He could not reconcile. He could not understand. He could not see. The view was opaque or even black to be able to see that as he walked with Isaac, he knew somehow God was going to do something in the midst of his promise. And so he says, he considered that God, in verse 19, was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figurative speaking, he did receive him back, as he's ready to thrust the knife down on and through the chest of Isaac, that he knows if he did that, that God somehow would raise him from the dead, because God will fulfill his promise. God will fulfill it. You know, think about this. God gives and God takes away. Amen, right? We sing that song. He gives and takes away, he gives and, ah, yes, you do. And it's easy to sing on a Sunday morning. It can be hard during the week when the event actually occurs, right? That's when it's hard that sometimes the song doesn't come to mind and you don't want to sing. He may give you a child for a season and then take that child away. He may give you good health for a season and then take that good health away. He may give you the job of your dreams for a season and then take that away. In Houston, he may give you a home for a season and then flood it out for his own purposes. True, genuine faith looks to heaven, even in the midst of the struggle and tears, and says, I trust you. I trust you. I trust what you're doing. I believe your promises. They aren't fading, even in the midst of waist-deep water, in the midst of a home, even in the midst of a hospital visit. I remember one guy sharing, actually it was his sister sharing, of a single mom down at uh, oh, the cancer hospital. 
uh, thank you, M.D. Anderson, of a 12-year-old boy and a single mom. No other family. And the 12-year-old dies. Is God faithful then? Because if it doesn't work then, it doesn't work. When everything's going great, hey, you're so faithful, yeah. But what about when he breathes his last, your only son? There's no one else, and you're left alone to weep. If your faith does not work in that circumstance, it doesn't work. But pleasing, genuine faith says to God, I trust you. Though you slay me, I will trust you. I will hope. If God asks you to give up your career for him, will you do it? I don't want you to shake north south yet. If God was saying, I want you to move to another part of the world to be my proclamation of witness, are you willing to do it? If God says, I want you to take that big fat retirement nest egg and I want you to invest it here in my kingdom, wherever the here is or whatever part of the world that you get a passion for, are you willing to do it? Are you willing to sacrifice for the sake of all that God has done for us? That's a faith that is pleasing to him. That says, Lord, it's all yours. You've given it. Take it away if you want it. It's all yours. Because a pleasing faith is an offering faith. It says, God, if you want me to move elsewhere and go serve you in some other foreign land, my bag is packed or not, but I will go. Because a faith is willing to sacrifice. Amen? Fourthly, finally, Pleasing faith is a persevering faith, is a persevering faith. Faith that pleases God in just for a, a brief period, a few days, few weeks, few months, few years, but it's a persevering faith. Oh, this is so good at the end. As we go through our portrait gallery, we get to see in the room with Abraham are also his son and his grandson. By faith, Isaac, verse 20, invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Whenever a king or a famous person wants to be painted, it's surely not at the end of their life. They want to be painted when they look like they come off the cover of GQ. There have been kings in the past who would kill the artist because they didn't like the way they're painting, how they were presented. I love the fact that here, he fast forwards to the end of their lives to Isaac, to Jacob, to Joseph. And he describes what were they doing at the end of these lives. Because these aren't the strapping young men they once were. They are now the old men. And they're described as possessing faith in the promise that their father, grandfather, and great-grandfather had passed on to them. And their faith was still very much a part of their life at the end of it. And all of these men never had opportunity to lay hold of the promise. But yet they would speak to each one and say, I'm going to bless you. God has done amazing things. In fact, in Genesis 27, here was Isaac was the son of promise. So he blessed Isaac. So here's Abraham, Genesis 27. So he came near and kissed him. Uh, I'm sorry, this is Isaac to Jacob. And Isaac smelled the, the, the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. When in the world has that happened yet? What nations have bowed down to any of them? None. But yet, it's on his mind because God has made a promise. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. And then the writer goes on to Jacob, and when at the end of his life, he says in Genesis 48, 15, and 16, and Jacob blessed Joseph and said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all of my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys. And in them, let my name be carried on and the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. How big was this clan now? This isn't hard. Not big, right? This is small. But yet notice, he believes God's going to do something amazing. And then Joseph at the end of, in Genesis 50, and Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you. 
and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died, being 110 years old. They embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And when Israel was finally delivered at the beginning of Exodus, what did they have with them? The bones of Joseph. Because God had made a promise, and it was passed on and passed on. It's a constant reminder during the captivity. Wait, our forefather Joseph said to take his bones out of here. People were going to be leaving. I don't know when, but kind of have a few suitcases standing by because we're ready to go. See, God's promises and God's word is passed on and is passed on. And it's a reminder of God's faithfulness. Their faith did not waver. They still had hope. And there is something precious to all of us about the end of someone's days. If you've ever been with an old saint when they've breathed their last. And it tells them, or it tells us, what it is to live for. The best things you parents and you grandparents can pass on to your children and grandchildren is not a rich inheritance. Leave that to the church. Or a big, that was supposed to be funny, people, and you totally missed that. Or a big whatever, but a big, robust faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. May that be what they remember about you. And not to like, well, he gave me whatever. Forget that. The faith is what's going to compel him to the greatest inheritance that they could ever receive. I like what Jonathan Edwards said on his deathbed after he had read the, uh, in, the uh, vaccine for the smallpox, which ultimately killed him. Now, where is Jesus of Nazareth, my true and never-failing friend? Trust in God, and you need not fear. And then Jonathan Edwards died. Or Thomas Vincent, at the age of 44, in 1650-something, I think he died. Thomas Vincent said, Dear Jesus, come and take me away. I have no business here. My work is done. My glass is run. My strength is gone. Why shall I stay behind? Oh, come, come, be as a row upon the mountains of spices. How long shall I wait and cry? How long shall I be absent from you? Oh, come and take me to yourself and give me possession of that happiness which is above, the vision of yourself, perfect likeness to yourself, full fruition of yourself without any interruption or conclusion. Oh, come, dear Jesus, how long before you send your chariots? Oh, come, you down to me and take me up to you. And then the doctor walked in. <laughs> told the doctor to get out. <laughs> you're interrupting something here, sir. I'm dying and going to heaven, and you're standing in my way. So he told the physician to leave, and he died. Or maybe what the apostle Paul said, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. All who have loved his appearing. And this was the hall of Abraham. To have a faith that is pleasing to God, that sacrifices, that sojourns, that obeys, that follows, that continues in perseverance all the way to the end. No wonder the Lord will say to those who have persevered, who have done this, well done. Why? Because faith that is true, genuine faith, pleases him. And he wants to say, well, well done. So what is the first step of faith for us? Hopefully you're not sitting around waiting for a vision of God, the God of glory to come and promise you land, seed, and blessing. Because he's not going to do that. It's all through the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's our first step of faith? Placing our trust in the son of promise. Not in Isaac. That was for Abraham. The son of promise is the Lord Jesus Christ. That in Christ, all the blessings are through him. And so we come as a people and we say, it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about following him. It's about putting our faith and our trust and our hope in him and doing what he says. That is what God calls us to do as his people. That is faith that the Father says, trust my son and you will be pleasing to me as the Father. Some of you have yet to do that. Some of you have yet to put the faith 
in the Lord Jesus Christ. And until you do that, you will never have whatever you define faith as. It will never be pleasing to God because the faith that pleases God is a faith that draws near to God and must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And that is only in Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're thankful that in Christ we have all the promises that Abraham was looking forward to one day. They are yes to us in Christ. Thank you for that. Thank you that in Christ we have forgiveness of th sins. Thank you that in Christ we have eternal life. Thank you that we have a home and a city whose builder and maker is God. Thank you that this world is not our home, this world that is so full of violence, so full of hatred, that has been cursed from the fall. Thank you that you're making a new world for us, a new world for all your people to come and to dwell for all of eternity in perfection with the glory of God and, and no sin, no death, and people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. Oh, Lord, give us the faith that perseveres. Give us the faith and increase our faith that truly wants to live this out. For the praise of your glory, we ask this. Amen. Stand together.
he has made every promise he has made you're holding give me a north south come on people every promise he has made then it changes how you live changes where your affections are changes where your heart is if you truly believe what you just sang oh god increase our faith amen increase our faith it's hard we get that that's why he's given us a community so today don't run out greet one another as we close, well, unless you have kids in the nursery, go get them and rescue the nursery workers. Long-winded preacher in there. Uh, but then go out to lunch with some people. Go enjoy one another. And uh, let's be a family. Amen. Our Father, we commit one another to your care. You're so kind and gracious to us. So merciful. Lord, you know our faith is so frail. But God, you remind us it's a gift from you. So we pray, Lord, that as a faith is a gift from you, it's also a muscle. May we exercise it regularly. Oh, Lord, draw us to yourself. May Jesus appear to be so precious to us. May the affections of our heart rise to love your word. Love you, Lord, more than this world that we see. May we long for the unseen. Glorify yourself in the church. We pray in Christ's name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You are dismissed. And you are loved. Amen.